Okay, good afternoon. We'll get started now. We're up to the third paragraph. Actually, it's not the third paragraph of the first chapter. Yosei ben Yochanan. There were two Yosis. And they represented the two leadership of the Jewish people. And they were the ones who received the tradition from their predecessors, Antignos and Shimon. And it seems that they were both, actually, three of them were addressing the three pillars upon which the world stands. If you remember, Shimon HaTzadik, the world stands on three things, Torah, Avoda, Avoda we translate as service, but it refers to the sacrifices or prayer, and Milos Hasadim, acts of kindness. So those are the three pillars. So Atignos focused on Avoda. What's real service? When could you say you really think that can be considered service? It's when it's not self-serving. The definition of service is when it's not for ulterior motives. Even though, as we discussed last week and the week before, that a person should do good, even if it's for ulterior motives, Eventually, that will lead the person to doing it for the right reasons. But Pirkeyot was written, not, it's written for someone who wants to achieve a higher level. He wants to go within the order of the law. He wants to go beyond. That's the definition of chassid. The father is because a chassid is someone who goes beyond the requirements of the law. Maybe some of I'll give you the Talmudic example of what it means to be a chassid. But for now, Shimon HaTzadik just said there are three things, three pillars. So Antignos focuses on the pillar of Avoda and says, service must be for pure reasons, not for the purpose of getting a reward. Then first Yossi, You should take the dust the words with so he focuses on Torah. The Torah is not just something you study when you have a few minutes, a few minutes there. You not only study Torah when you go to the teacher, go to the uh, Jewish Discovery Center uh, to learn Torah, but Torah should become part of your home. How do you make Torah part of your home? So one way is to always invite scholars to come to your house to meet there and to discuss words of Torah. Uh, if you can't do that, well, the second best thing is to buy Torah books and to line your house with Torah books. So your whole house should be filled with books, with Torah books, so it permeates the whole atmosphere. You should first. You have to buy it. Then you put it in a shelf. And you take it out of the shelf, and you open it and you study. Right. But even when you're not learning, the fact that it's there, it reminds you that this is a house of Torah. The Torah permeates this whole house. So that is the other thing. The second focus is on the third pillar: acts of kindness. And acts of kindness can be translated two different ways, or it could be applied two different ways. One act of kindness is, let's say you're walking down the street and you see someone homeless who looks emaciated and you take out a dollar, you give it to him. Or you buy him a sandwich and you give it to him. That's a beautiful gesture of kindness. But that's not the kindness he's talking about here. When does kindness really mean that you're going beyond when your home becomes a source of kindness? In the uh, paragraph, Yosef ben Yochanan of Jerusalem, there's a little typo over there, led 
thy house open. What does he mean by open? not something that we ought to that if this thing to your house he's saying something more your house open he had an entrance in every by the way is one of the chupa is you know, four poles with canopy, but it's open on four sides as a way of saying that our home should be open on all four sides. Now, it doesn't literally have to be open. And you're allowed to be with security, especially nowadays, but much other The mindset has to be that. Good afternoon. What <laughs> <laughs> And <laughs> so the mindset has to be one that your house is an inviting place for for guests. And the Hebrew word over here, Lurvacha, simply means wide open. Revach in Hebrew means ample space, but it also means profit. And the commentaries explain what the people get excited about when they make profit. When people invest in business, and sometimes the business could occupy their whole life, and that's all they think about, especially if you own the company. You go to sleep thinking about the business, you wake up thinking about the business, and your whole day it's just the business, business, business. Well, that's how you should think about your guests. You wake up in the morning, you should think, who am I gonna have in my house today? And likewise, when you go to sleep, the focus should be on the guests, that this is the most profitable thing for the person. So that's the first teaching, he says. Your house should be open wide for as many guests. Now, just to, to, to uh, point out a halachic matter, the mitzvah of inviting guests into your home, technically, is, is only with someone who doesn't have a place to stay, someone who's traveling. But if you just invite your friends over, that's a separate mitzvah. It's a mitzvah to show friendship to one another. It's a mitzvah of Ahavat Yisrael, showing love for your fellow. That's not hachnasat orchim. That's not the mitzvah of inviting guests. Inviting guests means if someone is traveling through town and needs a place to stay, you could say, well, there's always a you know, red roof, Motel 6. <laughs> they, they, when some Jews came to America from Europe, they said there's this Jew who's a very wealthy Jew. And what's his name? His name is Motel. So it goes, wherever he went, he saw a Motel. <laughs> so a big place, a hotel, and it said Motel. And it was six of them <laughs> in the Mishpach. So. Motel 6. <laughs> Matl is a nickname for Mardchai. So he thought, Matl, this Jew Matl owns the, the whole country. He has houses all over. So if you really want to fulfill the mitzvah, it's someone who needs a place to stay, literally needs a place to stay. Everything in Judaism starts with the Jewish people, but then extends outward. It says in the Talmud that you're supposed to be charitable to your own first, take care of your family. Charity begins at home. But then you're also, to promote peace and unity, you also have to give to others, to non-Jews as well. But the focus should, certainly should be on your own community. Uh, 
just uh, it's an, I think an important thing if every community would take care of its own and do a little bit more for others the world would be a perfect world but the problem is that most communities don't take care of their own and they use the argument well we can't just take care of our own we have to save the whole world so they save nobody <laughs> you save your own and everyone does it and then you go, go a little bit beyond that the world would be a perfect world right the, the mitzvah tzedakah begins literally at home if your family uh, extended family then your community although giving stock to Israel is considered to be equal to your own community because every Jew belongs to Israel so that's like his own community and then when you have more money you, you give to other communities uh, outside of your own community and, and so on and so forth uh, okay the second point is let the poor be members of your household what does that mean so the simple meaning of that is that you should invite poor people into your home some people say I like guests but they have to be rich they have to be uh, people of, of, of stature people that will enhance my own my own uh, life and make me look make, make me look good it gives me status I have look who I have over to my house I have important people over no you should make sure that you have poor people who are at your house no less so than rich people doesn't mean you shouldn't invite rich people in fact some say that you should invite rich people as well as poor because if you only invite poor the poor people feel very uncomfortable oh you're inviting me because I'm a I'm a nebuch you know I'm, I, I'm a and it makes them feel very uh, very uncomfortable and one of the key things in inviting a guest into your home that the guest has to feel comfortable and the guest has to feel as it's not just a cliche people say make yourself at home well does that mean they can go into your bedroom and lie down with their boots on your on your bed where they can just go to the freezer and take out and cook a steak and do whatever they want well if you really meant it yes and just there's a little story of a of a uh, chassid whose father was not interested in the Hasidic uh, traditions and the son was always trying to get his father to join him at the Rebbe I don't, I don't know what Hasidic group it was and finally the father relented and says okay I'll do you a favor I'll go for Shabbos to see your Rebbe but it's not my cup of tea Shabbos is over and the uh, father says it was very nice but uh, you know it, it didn't appeal to me this is not my uh, style so the son says okay dad you know I asked you to go you went but could you please just go with me one more place every Saturday night there's a custom to have a Malava Malka Malava Malka means escorting the Queen a final meal saying goodbye to Shabbos you don't just you can't just run away from Shabbos you have to make a meal uh, because that's what Jews do <laughs> every occasion is associated with and revolves around a meal and it's customary in, in the Hasidic circles and many other circles that you invite a lot of people your friends over to this meal so the father comes and sits down at the table and he sees someone sitting at the head of the table so he imagines he must be the host then he sees someone else doing all the serving so oh, he must be the host and then almost every other person there acted as if it was his house and he could never figure out whose house it was he says if this is what you can do to get people to feel so such a brotherly feeling towards one another I want to be part of that group so the the idea is that you have to really make the person feel comfortable but you should certainly see to it that poor people on your house another commentary says that what it means about having poor people members of your household it's referring to people who work in your house if you could hire someone to do a job but instead of hiring someone a company that does the job you can find someone who knows how to do it let's say someone to fix something but happens to be poor and that's your way of helping the poor by giving him or her a job in your house you should make an effort of looking for poor people to do the work in your house 
So that whether it's serving, whether it's fixing things, they should be your household members. Okay. Now we get to the interesting. Engage not altar besicha im ha'isha. Engage not in too much conversation with women. Uh, that's not literally the translation. I'll soon go to the literal translation. But before I go to it, let me just explain something. Whenever, whenever rabbis give teachings, they always try to point out that there might be some pitfalls. That sometimes what you're doing, which is for p good purposes, could actually lead to something negative. And what happens in a social situation, and this is a fact of life, whether we like it or not, it's a fact of life, that in a social setting, men will gravitate to socialize with the women. You don't think that that's the case? <laughs> well, they both are true. Yes, men stick to themselves. But if you have a, your guest, you have a man and you have a woman, and you start talking to the woman, not because she's a human being, not because she is intelligent, not because she's, you know, a guest in your house, but because she's a woman. And that's what it says over here. It doesn't say don't speak, engage in too much conversation with women. It doesn't say that. That's not the translation. It says, don't engage in too much conversation, and it, the word sicha could also mean idle talk with the woman. What does it mean, the woman? The woman, no, the woman means with the fact that she's a woman. Why are you talking to her? Not because she's a human being, not because she's just like any other guest, but you're focusing on her because of her femininity. That's the reason you speak to her. That's dangerous. In other words, when, whenever you have social situations, this is a reality of life, there's always the danger that it could lead to things that are untoward, things that are immoral. And you know that all acts of immorality, maybe I shouldn't say all, but many, if not most, begin with a social setting. And that's one of the reasons why we don't drink wine. What's, what makes wine kosher wine? Kosher wine is wine that, that was made and manufactured by Jews. Why did the rabbis ban non-Jewish wine? For a very simple reason, because wine leads to socializing, or socializing leads to drinking wine, and drinking wine leads to levity, and levity leads to getting closer to the other person, and that leads to intermarriage. Yes, yeah, she was first. <laughs> no, she was first. She was, she was first. <laughs> yes, it doesn't say you can't, no. No, it's saying something, it doesn't say that you can't be. It says don't talk excessively because you're focusing on her because she is a woman and that's why you're talking to her and you're engaging in idle chatter. You're not talking to her words of Torah. You're not talking to her words of business if it's a business meeting. You're not talking to her words of politics if you're, if you're discussing politics. You're just finding an excuse to talk to her because it's a woman. And that is a pitfall in having a lot of guests over your house. In other words, Rabbi Yosef said, yes, have as many guests as you can have. But be careful, realize that there can be a danger involved. You should never just take that as a license. That just because you have people in your house, it's a license to go to excesses. And then the Mishnah goes on and says, the truth is, ishto amru. This was even said about one's own wife. In other words, don't treat your wife as an object. Don't treat your wife only because she's a woman. Obviously, you marry someone because she's a woman. And b believe it or not, we still believe that a man should marry a woman and not any other way. And any other way is not kosher. But be that as it may, yes. It just reminds me of when you say the 
Right. They bristle at that. I understand why. Yes, and, uh, but there's a but there's an answer to that. There's an answer to that. If you want to hear the answer, I'll, okay, okay. It takes time to to give the answer. First of all, you have to. No, no, I'll give it right now. <laughs> I'll give it right now. Uh, the the context in which those three blessings were said. Thank God you haven't made me a non-Jew. They haven't made me a slave. You haven't made me a woman. What are these three? Yeah, I just before I give you the answer, just to tell you a little story. In the Middle Ages, in the uh, 13th century, uh, rabbis were forced into debates about Christianity with Christian clergy, and they were forced into it. If they lost the debate, that would mean that Jews have to convert. If they won the debate, you're you're attacked our religion, so we have to destroy you. We have to kill you. So it was a lose-lose situation. But one of the questions that they asked the rabbi, I think it was Nachmanides, there were a few rabbis who did this, was how come you recite a blessing every morning that you haven't made me a non-Jew, a Gentile? That means you hate Gentiles, you hate non-Jews. So the rabbi says, obviously that's not what it means because we also say you haven't made me a woman. Do we hate women? That was what the rabbi said 800 years ago. So it was, it, it was not understood as a rejection of women. But then why is it said and what's the context? The context originally, it's in the, in the Talmud, in Talmudic literature, and the context is that we are grateful to God for our mitzvahs that we have. The more mitzvahs a person has, the more grateful we are. A Jew has more mitzvahs than a non-Jew. A free person has more mitzvahs than a slave. A man has more mitzvahs than a woman. Not that many more, but more. So we're thanking God that you did not make us a woman who has fewer mitzvahs. Now, I just want to use an analogy. You have two people that are hired. Let me, let me just finish this analogy. You'll understand it better. Two people are hired to work in a company. One of them is hired to be a salesperson. The other one is hired to be the manager of the company. Okay, the salesperson is given a car because they have to travel all over. The manager, who's getting a much higher salary and much more responsibility, is not given a car. So the uh, manager says, what's going on over here? I'm the manager, I'm the top person, I'm the, 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 uh, the vice president of the company, and I wasn't given a car, and this little uh, shmigegi, you know, <laughs> this nobody of a person, you know, just a, a novice and doesn't have any standing in this company was given a car. Says, you know what, that person as low as they are in the business, they have to travel. And you can't travel without having a car. You don't need to travel because, and you have a much more important role. You have to be at home base. You have to be oversee the whole operation. You don't need the car. That's an, an, an analogy. Why do we have so many mitzvahs? Why do we need so many mitzvahs? One of the reasons given is because, and men, why have, do they have more than women? Because men, have, uh, number one, more interaction with the hostile outside world. Men ideally, not, not ideally, but men uh, in, in, in terms of reality throughout history had to be outside, had to fight wars, whether it's a war with an, a hostile country or whether it's a war with your competitors. You had to you have to be involved in the outside world, and the outside world has tremendous amount of temptation, tremendous amount of obstacles, tremendous amount of distractions from, from your Jewish identity. And God says, you need this mitzvah. You have to put on tefillin every morning that fortifies you and strengthens you because you're a salesman. You're traveling, and you need to have special protection. The woman, on the other hand, her home base is literally and, and figuratively, she is the manager, she runs the show. The woman is the one who instills the warmth, the love, the passion, the, the uh, commitment to Judaism into the family. The mother is, the, the wife and the mother is called the Akeret Habayit, the foundation of the home. 
So she doesn't need as many mitzvahs as the man because she's not in that position. She has a much, much more crucial position and much more, uh, much and superior position. The man was so. If the man was given fewer mitzvahs, as many mitzvahs as the woman, so he would be denied the opportunity to protect himself. That's why he says a blessing. Thank you. You didn't take away. The, the opportunities for me to be able to survive as a man. You gave me more mitzvahs. Besides the in the morning, what other mitzvahs do men have that women don't have? Not that, not, not that many. Tefillin, tzitzes, they don't, they don't have to daven with a minion. They don't have to, uh, they don't have to daven three times a day. They don't have to say all the prayers. They have, they have less restriction, not less restrictions, but less requirements, fewer requirements, I should say, than men. Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. Absolutely. Right, but they, they don't have as many obligations, and primary the obligation to study Torah full time is not a woman's obligation. They have to study Torah to know how to keep the mitzvot, as we discussed last week. But they don't have to study Torah as an end in, unto itself. Why? Because their role is much more crucial and they can't be forced into a role where they have to devote their attention to other things. They don't need it. Okay, with that, with that blessing, when a woman says, thank you, you made me according to your will, is actually the greatest compliment you can you can you can make because what it means is that when a man was created it was not, he was not created in conformance with God's will he has to work at reaching that level you know Adam was created from what from dirt Eve was created from a completed human being so a woman was created by nature, of course women can be evil and, w and many women have been evil and sometimes even more than men but the natural disposition of a woman is that she is created in the exact way that God had in mind for a human being to be it's a natural thing for a woman to do the right thing a man was created r raw material and needs to be perfected, needs to struggle, needs to needs to have so when she says she made me according to your will, it doesn't mean uh, you made me to be submissive, although there's nothing wrong with being submissive to God, men should also be submissive to God, but it means that you made me exactly as you wanted. I don't have to go through a, a, a transformation as the man does have to go through. I just want to bring but, up something and correct yeah. me if I'm mistaken. Um, women, I don't know if people know this, but in Judaism, I've always explained this to my non-Jewish friends, that women in Judaism are considered on a higher level than men are. And the reason is because at the Har Sinai and the Ego, the women refused to give over the jewelry. The men forced them to do that. That was one of the things. If you know Judaism, women are on a much higher level. The other thing is, talking about husband and wife, halakhically, if I'm not mistaken, it is the man who is required to get married. The woman is not required to get married. Am I correct? Halakhically, it is the man who is required to get married. A woman is not required to get married. Yes, that's true. Now you know the rest of the story. <laughs> but uh, but we, we, we're not going to cover everything that, about men and women. Just the point that I'm trying to emphasize is that Judaism considered a woman to be in a much more superior position in terms of what she contributes to the Jewish people. Now, so then why can't women be rabbis? Or why can't women uh, ha occupy positions of prominence? And the uh, it's a long discussion, but I'll just give you the, the gist of it. The truth of the matter is that a person, before they argue about what's more important than what, they have to have a, 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 a list a hierarchical list. What is considered to be the most accomplished thing in life? What's second? What's third? What's what's the last thing? In our society, when I say our society, I mean in secular society and in most religious societies, the top thing, the top accomplishment is 
power, wealth, fame. If you can reach that, if you could you know, become recognized by the whole world that you're so special, you have reached the pinnacle. That's what it is in society. Otherwise, if you're not famous, you're not rich, and you're not powerful, then what are you? You're a loser in our society. And who do we worship? If you ask a teenager, write down 10 people that you admire. Who would those 10 people be? What? Athletes, movie stars, singers, rock singers. It won't be their mother or father. That's the, those are the last people. You say the least admired people in your life it would be your parents if you're a teenager. <laughs> in our society, we worship we don't worship idols of statues as they used to, but we have worse idols. We worship people because of their physical prowess, because of their beauty, because of their wealth. And that's what people aspire to. When, you're, when you raise a child, what do you want your child to become? You want your child to become successful. How do you measure success? How rich they are. That's the opposite of the way Judaism rates things. Judaism rates the highest achievement of a human being is to be close to Hashem and no one in the world knows who you are and how close you are to Hashem. Unfortunately, there's a need for leaders. So great Jewish leaders reluctantly, begrudgingly, were forced into becoming leaders and hated the public recognition. This is true about Moses and it goes down to every generation from Moses to the Rebbe that it was the last thing they wanted to be and it was in a, in a public thing. To them it was a punishment that, they, that other people would know about them and their greatness and they tried to hide it as much as possible. And I remember as a child there was a Jew who used to come to shul. He had no children so he liked me. Uh, I was uh, eight, nine years old. He used to pinch my cheeks. I could still feel it. And you know what he would wish me? He would say to me, and I can never forget it, he'd say to me, one day you'll be a great, great rabbi, but nobody in the world will know it. That was his blessing to me. This was a simple Jew, this, but it was so ingrained in him that the greatest achievement is that you don't know, no one knows about who you are. You have a private relationship with God. So in, in terms of that, if that's the highest ideal, where, who gets the most recognition in society? Obviously, the men. Or well, now it's changing, of course, because women have the more women in college, more women are becoming doctors. In the non-orthodox wor world, uh, most uh, rabbis now are, are women, because they're 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 actually emulating men instead of appreciating their own value and of of the fe of femininity how beautiful their private relationship with God is, they're looking to copy men and sometimes the worst aspects of masculinity. So we consider, so women are not in positions of power because that's not considered to be the highest ideal. So, but if you follow the secular world, yes, it's true. Women are second class citizens from a secular point of view, but that's not how we view the, the highest levels. Yes. Can I just back up? Okay. Sure. So, okay, so I understand, you know, why you would say that men shouldn't engage in conversation with other women. Not they shouldn't engage. They shouldn't engage in excessive, excessive. in too much conversation. That means they're focusing strictly on the fact that she's a woman and looking for ways of engaging in conversation with her beyond what, what, what might be necessary for a normal social discourse. But what about the part that says that they uh, also with, with regard to one's own wife? Right. What is, what is, Again, you shouldn't treat your own wife as just because she's a woman, not because she's a, a human being. This is, I think this is the most most uh, liber women's libera liberating statement that don't treat a woman, including your wife, as simply a woman. That's one part of her uh, identity, but it's not her, that's not, I mean, she's a human being. And she's not just a human being, she's a very special human being, otherwise why did you choose her? <laughs> you, had good, you had good judgment if you chose, you chose the, the, your wife. I once heard that one should not do an excessive amount of negative 
discussions and talks in general. In that's general, the, with your wife, with anyone, right. with anyone, with anyone, right? With anyone, especially your wife, especially your wife, right? And then the Mishnah continues. <laughs> How much more so that this applies to another man's wife? From here the sages said, as long as a man engages in too much conversation, and again some translate this too much idle conversation with women, he causes evil to himself, which means it's, it's in, in intimating here it could lead to improper behavior, immodest behavior, but even if it doesn't, you don't have the second page? Look at your second page and look at this one. I think a lot of us have different second pages. This is what happens, you see? Yeah, it's two of the same. Mazel. Okay. You sure you don't need it? Okay, he causes... It's, okay. it's just... Like this a second he causes evil to himself, he neglects the study of the Torah, and in the end he will inherit Gehenna. What is Gehenna? Gehenna is the Hebrew version of, of hell. That means that at the very least, a man's obligation is to engage in Torah study every free moment. The only excuse that a man has not to study Torah is because he's doing something either to earn a living, he's doing something to help other people. Obviously, Communicating with your with your spouse and communicating with other people is part of life, uh, it's, which is necessary. But when you engage in excessive talk, you're certainly going to neglect your Torah study. And the end, it's a slippery slope. This is the idea of a slippery slope that when you fall down, you keep on going lower and lower. And we know that this happens frequently with people who uh, have no sense of responsibility, that time is very precious. And we shouldn't just waste our time with, with idle chatter with anyone, certainly not with someone who could le bring you down because you're focusing not on her as a person, but on her as a woman. Yes? Yes, yes, yeah, that, that, I mean, it's a fact of life that men are attracted to women. That's, that's the biological reality. And it's more than women are attracted to men. I know women sometimes argue with that, but, they, but that's, that's not reality. The reality is it has always been this way, that men are much more in need of things to restrict their uh, attraction to women who are not their wife. And so on. So I, I understand this, but then I don't understand so much about the parent about own wife. That's why I'm saying that if you talk to your own wife about things that are necessary, necessary for the home, for the family, for your relationship, that's fine. Not only is fine, it's required. It's required. Uh, the Talmud has a whole page talking about how a husband has to relate to his wife. And it says, and it's a metaphor, if you're, if you're very tall and your wife is short, bend down to talk to her. Which means, go, go, go down to her level and speak to her on her level. Don't try to act like you're taller and higher than her. Even if you are. In many cases, it's the other way around. The woman is, is taller than the man in terms of her knowledge. But that's obvious that he's not going to look down. But even when she's lower, yeah. Well, idle chatter. What's idle chatter? Gossip. Gossip is part of it. Talking about the latest uh, television shows. <laughs> things, things, you know, and just excessively, you know, they're just going on and on. Not, just not look, not talking anything of substance. It doesn't say that anything about television here. The rabbis of the Mishnah, I don't think, could have imagined <laughs> what, what uh, modern day television would be like, or movies, or uh, the internet. So, on the second page, if a man does those things, it's actually a way to hell? Is that what they're saying? Well, I tell you. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's, 
In other words, what, what Rabbi Yossi is saying, he's saying it's a very important that you have as many people in your home as possible. You, you have as many... <laughs> Was it was it a was it a man or a woman? <laughs> Rabbi Yossi is saying your house should be opened for as many people as possible. You should relate to these people, to talk to them. But that's that's what the rabbis do. Whenever they emphasize one thing and to they emphasize it to the extreme there's always a danger that people will abuse it. So they have to then pull it to the other extreme. So Rabbi Yossi is making two extreme remarks. One extreme is you have to go to extremes in having people in your home. The doors are open on all four sides. You invite everyone in. But then there's a danger over there. You can have unsavory people in your home who are going to bring the, the, the level, the atmosphere down. And one, one way that that happens is that men and women, when they socialize, that brings society down. I mean, where do we find socialization, men and women? You find that in bars. And those are not the most, you know, high level moral uh, environment to be in. Because that's, that's a fact of life, that socialization, over-socialization could lead you down. So that's why he's going to an extreme. He's telling you you could end up in Gehenna. Because he, he made an extreme statement about having all these guests. See, people, who, in Judaism, there's, people say, well, moderation is a good thing. No, moderation is not a good thing. Ex being extreme is good, but you have to be at both extremes. How do you be, a, so you end up being a moderate. See, you know the difference between a moderate and someone who has two extremes. A moderate is a person who says, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get myself excited about guests and I'm not going to get myself excited about, about, about immorality. I'm going to be just a simple person, just go straight. That's nice. That's fine. But here he's saying, no, you should go to extremes. You should be too extremely kind and welcoming, but extremely careful that it shouldn't lead you down. You have to be at both extremes. Then you're making a statement to her that she's not attractive. <laughs> then you're telling her that you're not attractive. You're insulting. You're implying that. You're insulting her by saying, you know, I can talk to you because I'm not attracted to you because you're not attractive. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, you should, you should, you should talk to every woman. The, the, uh, in a civil way, the way you talk to any other human being, but don't, don't allow yourself to be carried away by the fact that she's a woman, whether she's attractive or not attractive, because nobody knows what the tra attraction is in the mind of the beholder. So you treat every woman the same way. You don't say, "Well, you're attractive, so I'm going to be careful. I'm not going to talk to you too much. You're not, a, you're ugly. I'll talk to you." I mean, that's obviously. A very hor a horrible way of uh, dealing with people, but the, the mission is saying, be extreme in welcoming and extreme in caution. That's it. That's that's in a nutshell what this rabbi is saying. No connection to ushbizim, is there? No connection. Yes, there is. I was just thinking to myself. Ushbizim is. One if there's a connection. Ushbizim is a is a ushbizim is a guest. Just, about. just conclude, although the, the, it's already one o'clock, if anyone has to leave, they're more than welcome to leave. But uh, uh, my father, a blessed memory, gave a commentary on the statement in the Talmud that inviting guests into your home is greater than welcoming the Divine Presence. We learn that from Abraham. God is talking to Abraham, and then he sees three guests, potential guests, and he says to hey, God, God, I have more important things to do than to talk to you. He didn't say those words, but he implied that by bringing the guests in and telling God to wait. So from this we derive that welcoming a guest is more important or is greater than welcoming God himself into your home. So my father gave this explanation. He said, when, you, when a person doesn't have a home, a homeless person, 
that person is lacking the greatest amount of humanity of any other type of lack. A person who doesn't have food is suffering, that's terrible. But they don't lose their human dignity. If you don't have a home, that means you have no place where you can be yourself. Because every human being has two personas. One, a public persona, and the other is when you're in your own home. You can be whatever you want to be. It's your home. You can be yourself. If you don't have a home, that means you have no place where you can actually be who you are. You're always on stage. You're always in a public arena. That's why if you take a guest, a guest is someone who doesn't have a home, even if it's temporary, but right now this person is traveling, they don't have a home, and when you don't have a home, you lose some of your dignity, and you bring them into your home, what you're doing is you created a human being. So you're not just welcoming the Divine Presence, you're a partner with the Divine Presence. Just like God creates us, we're creating another human being. Every time you help give someone a roof over their head, that's why the scourge of homelessness, which is growing in this country, uh, which is one of the worst possible things in this country, people do not appreciate how terrible it is for someone who doesn't have a place to stay. And even when you're traveling, you know, I know for myself, if, I'm, if I don't have a place to stay, it's, it's, it's very, very, uh, not just uncomfortable, it's, it takes away your dignity. If you're hungry, okay, you'll lose a few pounds and it doesn't hurt. <laughs> but if you don't have a place to stay, you're really in bad shape. Lord, I see this a lot, and sometimes here in Buffalo, sometimes people will decide, help me, I'm hungry, yeah. and stuff like that. Are those considered really homelessness? Should we invite them to our house? Or is this going to be only for Jewish people who come to our house from different cities? Well, we're living in an age where you have to be very careful about who you bring in your house, especially if you have children. So, unfortunately, you have to be a little bit more discriminating. But... If you, when you know that the person is for real, yes, you should bring them into your house. Absolutely. Yeah. Charity is extended to everyone. Although the, the emphasis and the focus has to be on your own. If it's your nephew who needs a place to stay, and you only have room for one person, and there's a, uh, a more distant person, you bring your nephew. But, if you have room, you bring the other person as well. Right, nowadays, we, yeah, we had bank robbers and drug dealers. <laughs> yeah. So,